Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we are going to look at the scriptures from Proper 19. Proper 19. We will continue our study of the three books of the Bible that we've been discussing and learning from for several weeks now. Job, Acts, and John. So in the book of Job, a beautiful Old Testament book, very well known by many people, the subject of wisdom and Job's suffering, and I'll say more about that in a couple of minutes. Acts, the book of Acts, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the journeys of Peter and Paul, and what God did with the early church after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, which happened in Acts chapter 1, by the way. We'll be looking from Acts 15.36 to Acts 17.34. Now, we always include a gospel reading, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we are in John right now, and we're going to be looking at John eleven fifty five 55 through John 12, 50. Now, the idea in the Daily Lectionary series is to give you an overview of the week of scriptures that are offered to you, to encourage you to read the scriptures and reflect upon the scriptures and perhaps even pray over the scriptures. You might also consider listening to what God has to say regarding the scriptures that he has given us for this week. And so, let's go back to Job. Now, we're going to look at Job 38, Job 40, Job 42, Job 28. And then we will, on the last couple of days, Friday and Saturday, look at the book of Esther which we will continue in next week, proper 20. Job 38. Well, you have been following me for some time looking at the book of Job and Job's travails, and his friends have given him advice and counsel. Then finally, we see 38 verse 1. The Lord answered Job out of the storm. So for many, many chapters, Job has been responding and his friends have been responding. Now it's God's turn to respond. So we begin with the 18th verse verse through uh, the 41st verse. Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Verse 18. Tell me if you know all this. So what's happening is that Job is very upset that he's lost his livelihood. He feels like he's lost his life. He has been decimated by problems in his life. He is upset that God has allowed this to happen or made this happen, and he's wondering what in the world is God doing? Now, as I've said to you before, God is not going to answer his direction, his his questions directly. He's going to speak to Job in this 38th, 39th, 40th, 40th and 41st chapters, he's going to speak to Job and show how great he is, how infinite he is, how powerful he is. And in that analysis of God showing himself, Job is going to realize how great God is and how small he is. So he asks him a series of questions and he asks them, Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? The answer is rhetorically, obviously, no. And what is the way to the abode of life? Light. And where does darkness reside? Verse 19. Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. You're so smart, Job. Tell me about light and darkness. Tell me about light and darkness. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? Do you know anything about that, Joe? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives, a desert with no one in it? To satisfy a desolate wasteland, verse 27, to make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drip, drops of dew? Joe, do you know anything about this? Do you, have, do you know the laws of the heavens, Job, verse 33? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Are there any of these questions you can answer, Job? 
Verse 36, who endowed the heart with wisdom and gave understanding to the mind? Do you think you did that, Joe? Do you think all these blessings that you had and all this wisdom that you have and all this understanding that you have is yours? Who provides food, verse 41, for the raven when it cries out to God and wanders about for lack of food? Let's go to the 40th chapter, 1 through 24. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Would you like to correct me, Job? Do you know more than the God who created the universe? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. That's a smart answer. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Brace yourself like a man. Verse 7. I will question you and you shall answer me. That's very powerful. So read through this extraordinary section in chapters 38 and 40. And let's go to 41. More questions. Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Verse 7. Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? If you laid a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Verse 11. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Job really didn't have any idea what he was doing and any idea what he's saying. I suspect that we do the same sometimes when we get mad at God and we question God and we wonder if he's asleep or if he's forgot us or he didn't remember or there's something that's terrible that's going on in our lives and he doesn't care about us and he doesn't show mercy anymore. Yes, God knows exactly what he's doing. And so, in chapter 42, the last chapter, Job responds. Job responded, replied to the Lord, I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. I love this line, verse 5. My ears had heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. I have seen you. I have heard you. And I know what my place is. I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. And so there's an epilogue. Chapter 42, 1 to 17. And you know what happened? God restored Job. God restored him. The Lord, verse 12, blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. Enjoy reading that 42nd chapter. Take some time with 38 and 39 and 40 and 41 and then the celebration of 42. Chapter 28. So he goes back to 28, 1 through 28. Job 28. And this is Job speaking Verse 12, where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Man does not comprehend its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. And so we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about wisdom. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed in silver. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Where does wisdom come from? Great question. Where does understanding dwell? I suspect, as you're listening to me and reading these scriptures with me, that you wonder, where can I be or how can I be a wiser person? How can I have more understanding and knowledge? How can I learn not to make all kinds of mistakes all the time? Verse 21, it is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth, verse 24, and sees everything under the heavens. 
when he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, that he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to man, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. That is a great thing to keep in mind from God Almighty that we should all do. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To shun evil is understanding. What a great book, the book of Job. Now, in the Bible, we have Ezra, we have Nehemiah, and we have Esther. Now, the book of Esther is a, what we call a history book, and you find it after Ezra, Nehemiah. And the book of Esther takes place during the Persian Empire. Go to chapter 1. And it says in verse 1, this is what happened to the time of Xerxes, the Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. So as we go from east to west, you have India and you're going all the way to the upper Nile. So the Persians had an extraordinary large landmass that they governed. Okay. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the city, citadel of Susa. This is verse 2. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet. The military leaders were there. And for a full 180 days, verse 4, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Very large mass, big deal, very powerful man. He gave a banquet. I'm kind of reviewing to verse 5. And by the king's command in verse 8, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. And the queen also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. All right. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in, this is verse 10, was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him the queen wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Not an unusual request. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. That is not something you do to a king. The king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for a king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the laws and were closest to the king. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of the king. Queen Vashti has done wrong, not against the king, but also against the nobles and all the people in the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will be known to all the women, so they will despise their husbands. So they, the king and the queen, are very important role models. So, it says in verse 18 that this very day, the Persians and the Median women of the nobility have heard, who have heard of the queen's conduct will respond to all the, queen, the king's nobles in the same way. This will be no end. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. So, they issued a royal decree, and the king gave the royal position to someone else who is better than she. So, an edict was passed throughout the realm that all the women, with respect to their husbands, from the least of them to the greatest, and the kings and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as what was proposed. Every man should be ruler over his own household. So this could have upset the people that the king had led because of what the queen had done. So he fixed that. But then he has to go and get a new queen. Verse 2 of chapter 2. And what I'll do is I'll let you read that for the sake of time, and you will find out how Esther becomes the queen as a Jewish woman. It's a fascinating story. And next week we'll pick up on chapter 3. In Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, let's go to Acts chapter 15, beginning of the 36th verse. There was a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, and actually this is pretty famous. He says, Barnabas wanted to take John, also call, called Mark, with him, but Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. 
So they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas, this is chapter 15, verse 40, and committed the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Now, Mark happens to be the one that wrote the gospel. This was a major falling out between Paul and Mark. And at the end of Paul's life, it actually is rectified, which is good news. But even they had disagreements. So Barnabas and Mark went together and Paul and Silas. Now, what's the point? The point is that they are spreading the gospel out. They are sharing the gospel. They are going to lots of different places. And in chapter 16, you'll see Paul's vision to the man of Macedonia where um, Paul sees a vision. He got ready at once, verse 10, for Macedonia, concluding that God had called him to preach the gospel. So Paul is trying to listen for ways that God is going to speak to him to show him, Paul, where he should go and minister. There were lots of opportunities. If you look at a map uh, with the geography, with, with uh, the placement of all the countries and towns and cities, you'll see he, had, he could cover a very, very large area. Jerusalem to Greece. Lydia is converted in Philippi in chapter 16, and Paul and Silas go to prison. They go to prison. Once when they were going to a place of prayer, verse 16 of chapter 16, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And finally, Paul became so troubled that he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. And so they dragged Paul and Silas through the streets because they just lost the money. They lost this person that was generating money and income. And the crowd joined in the attack in verse 22. So these people suffered for the gospel. These people, um, it was very difficult uh, because they were dealing with pagan people. And sometimes pagan people didn't react to the gospel at all. So they were severely flogged in verse 23. They were thrown into prison. And Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They probably would have been killed. But what happens is, is a tremendous miracle God comes and saves them. An angel opens the door, and they are set free. Another beautiful thing that happens there is the jailer wants to kill himself because of the consequences of them getting out. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Very famous line from the Bible. What must I do to be saved? They ask Paul. Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Remember, belief is about your relationship with Christ and your belief in Christ. Please finish the 16th chapter, and you will see uh, the magistrates get involved. Uh, they talk about releasing these people. Um, the officers reported this to the magistrates. They heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. Now, the fact that they were Roman citizens was a big deal because they didn't have the authority to lock them up as they had done. Chapter 17, let's look at the 17th chapter. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 34. Paul goes to Thess Thessalonica. So at the back of your Bible, look at your atlas, and you'll see what Thessalonica is. And again, they're journeying. They're moving. They're going from town to town. In Thessalonica, again, they ran into problems with the Jew Jewish people. They go to Berea after that. And then Paul famously goes to Athens. When Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly, because he had to leave Berea, he had to leave Thessalonica, he was in danger. A lot of times Paul was in danger. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. This is Athens, the famous Athens. Now we're going to Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, okay? So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, verse 17, as well as the marketplace day and night day by day with those who appeared to be there. And they had the philosophers there, the Stoics and the Epicureans. They began to dispute. And so Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, in this particular situation, we have a uh, speech, if you will, by Paul. Now, previously, he's sharing the word of the Lord with folks in Philippi and in Thessalonica and Berea, but we don't have a text from uh, 
Paul that uh, we can look at, a, a speech that he gave, but he's got a great one here, one of my favorite in the Bible. Chapter 17, 24 to 31. And I want you to take your time and read that. I've read it many, many, many times. It's fantastic. I'll read 24 and verse 31. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is the creator. And in the past, verse 30, he overlooked ignorance in terms of the way they treated God. But now he commands all people everywhere to what? Repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man who he has appointed, who happens to be Jesus. And he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So in summary, what you have in Acts 16 and 17 is Paul is moving in and out of cities based on how long he can stay due to the danger from the Jews who are trying to hurt him, severely flog him, throw him in prison by a series of miracles God, uh, that God institutes in Paul's life. He protects him. He saves him. Now, he suffers pretty significantly, but Paul is able to continue his ministry. He preaches the gospel. He goes to famous places, Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, and shares the gospel with them. What I love especially about Acts are the beautiful speeches that he gives. Now, they're doing all of this because of Paul's relationship with Jesus. So we conclude our lectionary work by going to the gospel, as we always do every week. And we're looking at the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. 12. So we'll be looking at chapter 12 this whole week. Jesus is anointed at Bethany six days before the Passover. So we're at the end of his life. He enters triumphantly in verse 12. Remember on a donkey, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also illustrate that. He predicts his death. The hour has come, verse 23, for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So what I love about John, he's still teaching. And we've seen his teaching all the way to the beginning of chapter 1. We have Jesus speaking to us. We have it in chapter 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way to 12. And, of course, God speaks for the third time. And that happens uh, in verse 28, a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus tells them in 35, he tells the apostles, you're going to have the light a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Verse 37, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. So he's getting ready to do Passover. Remember, uh, then he, after Passover, he, he goes into Gethsemane, and then they take him uh, after Judas uh, betrays him, and Peter denies him. Before that happens, we have these wonderful chapters, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, that have this wonderful exposition of Jesus and what he's thinking about and what it means, the theology behind these events, and we see also that the Jewish people aren't really responding in a positive way. A couple of final verses. Verse 47 of chapter 12. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. I did not come to judge the world but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. So Jesus has very profound eternal words to give us. So we finish with Job, and Job finally meets God and repents in sackcloth and ashes. We, be, we also end the week with the first two chapters of Esther, who rises out of nowhere in this incredibly powerful um, kingdom of Persia and becomes the queen. But quite a bit happens after that. In Acts, Paul is journeying, and he's sacrificing his life, and he's giving it everything for the cause of the gospel. He even gives us some wonderful theology and message to think about. And Jesus continues in John inexorably toward his death. But in the meantime, John records some beautiful words that all of us need to think about. Enjoy the readings this week in Proper 19 and look forward to seeing you next week for Proper 20. God bless you.